Good evening. I'm Jacob Weiss, director of Yeshiva University Museum and associate professor of art history at Stern College for Women of Yeshiva University. And I'm delighted to welcome you to the special program on the image of the Haggadah and uh, to thank you for taking a break from cleaning and to join us for this wonderful program. Um, in nine days, um, as we're gathering um, for various sidorim, um, I will be reaching for my classic uh, red and yellow Haggadah with um, various wine stains uh, on the pages, uh, haroset smeared, and a distinctive Yaakov scrawled in a very rough fifth grade pen uh, over the cover. And I think like a lot of us, we have a very distinctive visual, physical, and of course gastronomic experiences of this wonderful liberational holiday. Of all the texts, um, Jewish texts, the Haggadah is the most uh, decorated, the most uh, illustrated, the most illuminated. And it is in that spirit that we present this program uh, with different perspectives on the imagery, on the visual traditions of the Haggadah, and what they teach us uh, about the celebration of Pesach. Um, I'm delighted and grateful to our partners um, here that are presenting this program. Uh, together with Yeshiva University Museum, Stern College for Women, Yeshiva College, the Bernard Revel Graduate School of Jewish Studies, and the Zahava and Moshal Strauss Center for Torah and Western Thought. Um, and I think in, in many ways uh, this presents uh, the kind of depth and, and richness of Yeshiva University, so I wanted to thank uh, you all for participating and, and for joining us here this evening. I wanted to um, just offer special thanks to Stu Halprin, uh, Assistant Director of operations at the Strauss Center and assistant director of student programming and community outreach at Revel for inspiring the idea for this program. I'd like to thank Malka Leibovich and, sorry, and Alina Moshayeva and my colleagues um, at Yeshiva University Museum for their help with this program. Um, I'd like to um, mention one other um, event that we have uh, upcoming here uh, related uh, to another uh, added dimension of Yeshiva University, which is uh, the seventh annual Stern College uh, for Women Senior Art Show that we'll be presenting opening on May 25th. So uh, for those of you who are interested in the visual uh, tradition and the way that um, a remarkable group of, of young women are carrying on this tradition in a, a very strong uh, foundational-based studio art program, we invite you to come back for that opening uh, on May 25th uh, and in the months that, that follow. Um, the four scholars um, who are going to be presenting uh, this evening, Mark Michael Epstein, Smadar Rosenzweig, and Ronnie Perilous, and, and Mayor Soloveitchik, presenting from various perspectives. And I want to thank uh, the four of you for being here and for joining in this program. Um, and um, what we're going to do is I'm going to introduce um, each speaker um, briefly. There are biographies uh, in your programs, um, and then invite um, all four of them at the end of the program for a discussion um, and to engage with you. Um, we will also have a, um, a surprise pop-up wine and water reception after the program where you can continue the questions. So thank you for being here. Mark Michael Epstein is professor on the Maddie M. Pashal and Norman Davis Chair in Religion and Visual Culture at Vassar College. He has written on various topics in visual and material culture produced f by, for, and about Jews. Um, his 2011 book, The Medieval Haggadah, Art, Narrative, and Religious Imagination, really provides a gloss and inspiration for many of the issues that we're going to be discussing here this evening. His most recent book, Skies of Parchment, Seas of Ink, Jewish Manuscript Illumination, was the winner of the National Jewish Book Award in 2015. Um, he will speak this evening on mirrors of Jewish life, are Passover images reflective or projective? Mark. Yeah. Hi, it's, wow, it's a great pleasure to be here. The joint is jumping, it seems. This is a wonderful and amazing turnout. Thanks to you, Stu, probably largely, but the attractions of this place and to all the related um, institutions. Um, I, I have a very, uh, let me time myself. I was given exactly 18 minutes. Um, I, 
there's significance to that, I think, okay. Um, I'm starting the stopwatch. Um, I, I have a very simple question, which is, uh, you know, when I was five years old, and using that uh, Haggadah, you know, that you refer to the yellow and, and uh, red one with the lamb on the cover, and, you know, um, my father pulled out a bunch of Haggadot from the Diskin Orphan Home series. I don't know if you recall these, which would come in the mail every, uh, every Pesach. And he would show me, you know, the Venice Haggadah of 1609. Look, Mark, this is how Jews live. This is what it looked like. Look how beautiful the homes. Look how wonderful the accoutrement. He didn't say accoutrement. But anyway, you know, he was really, he was really into that, you know, that, that, a, that a manuscript is somehow a window upon or a mirror of actual lived Jewish experience. And as I grew and developed and thought more and more about Jews and visual culture, I came to the conclusion that like most things within Jewish culture, it is, and yet it is not. And this afternoon, what I would like to do with you is to talk a little bit about reflection and or projection in art made for the Passover Haggadah. So, with your permission, um, a magnificent image of the Falk family at their Seder table, uh, created by Moshe Leib, the son of Wolf of Trebich in Moravia, probably around 1717, no, definitely in 1717, probably in Moravia. And what do you see? You see a magnificent family seated around a magnificent table, dressed gorgeously, right? Um, the table appears to be in an open porch of some sort, and we see an open door, uh, a painting ab above the door of Elijah the prophet. It's a little bit hard to see, but Elijah the prophet being fed by ravens, uh, the Judenstern hanging, the door open, and a cage with a bird prominently displayed, and some Three birds flying outside. We'll get to the birds as we proceed. Um, now the question is, is this image an image of Jewish life as it was in the 18th century? Well, there's one clue that it's not. It's framed. Do you see? We're looking in as if we are looking in through a window that is actually an elaborately carved frame. And the convention of talking about framing an image leads us to think that this is a projection of something rather than a reflection of something. I'll explain in a second. I want to show you a few more images. This bizarre scene occurs in the Griffin's Head uh, Haggadah, formerly called the Bird's Head Haggadah, until I got through with it. Um, it was created in uh, Ashkenaz, in Mainz, probably around 1300. It's now in the Israel Museum in Jerusalem. And it shows, again, a typical Passover scene. Uh, the, you have a, a table here with a, a, a very elaborately pleated tablecloth. People sitting at the table, ignore these bizarre faces for a second. That's a subject for another lecture, right? Raising glasses to the right? They're sitting there and they're singing the praises of God at the Seder, and all looks as if it could realistically be a realistic image from Ashkenaz around 1300, except we have an interloper at the Seder. And that interloper is this gentleman who is bringing in a red ram with golden horns impaled through its entrails and out its mouth on a stake. This is not a Passover Seder in Ashkenaz in 1300. There was a huge halachic debate, as some of you may know, Joseph Tabori has written about this, about the use of lamb or the possibility even of roasted food in Ashkenaz in the Middle Ages at the Seder because you didn't want to re replicate the Korban Pesach before its time, right? But this animal is the Korban Pesach. You see, Misha Asanisim Senu, the one who did miracles, performed miracles for our ancestor, Vilanu, and for us, what miracles has God performed for us? We live in the Middle Ages. Our life here is a tough life in Ashkenaz in the Middle Ages. And yet, God will perform miracles for us. God will restore the Beis Amigdash. God will restore the temple. And God will restore the Korban Pesach. What we see on this page is not a Passover Seder in Ashkenaz in 1300, 
but a Passover Seder in Messianic times. So it looks like one thing, but because the Korban Pesach is so prominently displayed there, it is another. In fact, in this Haggadah, you never see more than two people sitting kind of atomized on either side of a table. But here, in this image of Lefichach, everyone's together, men and women, raising glasses as the Korban Pesach is brought in. So this is not a reflection of the way we were, but a projection of the way we will be. Right? Which makes, begs the question of what we're seeing when we look at this. Okay, another example. Here's the very famous, made famous by Geraldine Brooks in her um, novel, which you either love or hate. If you're me, you hate it because it's just, you know, it's basically a romance novel dolled up as a, as a work of scholarship about who created Haggadot. But if you get into a different head, you could also love it. And there are days that I love it as well. The Sarajevo Haggadah, made in Catalonia, probably around 1350. And this very famous page, we see the family at the Seder table, including... Uh, the um, pater familias, right, who is reclining, and children, and women, and sons, and, and here we see the Moorish servant, okay? Now here's the question. It's entirely possible, in fact, probable, in fact, likely, in fact, a historical fact, that Jews in Catalonia in 1350 did have servants and non-Jewish servants. The question is, why is she in this manuscript? And I got into a little fight with, uh, with Vivian Mann, actually, uh, recently, who's a, who's a great sparring partner, I think, uh, about the uh, question of the bird's head Haggadah. I pointed out in the bird's head Haggadah that all the characters with their bizarre faces have blonde hair. It's a little hard to see in this illustration, have blonde hair. So she picked it up, uh, up on it immediately and said, oh, yeah, that's because Jews in Ashkenaz had blonde hair. I said, not every Jew in Ashkenaz had blonde hair. Let's be, she said, well, the Haggadah is very realistic. The vessels that we see and the, and the, and the, and the, um, the tablecloth, oh, sorry. The tablecloth, thank you for that. The tablecloth, you're like gesturing. The tablecloths that we see, we've, we, we know that those things existed in Ashkenaz. I said, Vivian, listen, here's what I believe is going on in here. In this manuscript, we're seeing Jews depicted as Jews wished to see themselves. Blonde hair meant something at this point in history. It doesn't mean that we're seeing a mirror of Jews who all had blonde hair. It means that Jews wished to display themselves, the haros es atzmam, to display themselves with blonde hair for particular reasons, political and otherwise. She disagreed. We fought for about 15 minutes. And then I said, Vivian, I will concede your point if you agree with me on one thing. And she said, what is that? I said, if this manuscript is literally a mirror, then every Jew in Ashkenaz in 1300 had a bird's head. That was the end of the conversation, right? So I would argue that in displaying prominently on your side of the table your black, your Moorish slave or servant, you are not only reflecting reality, but projecting yourself as a certain kind of person. When George Stubbs painted his famous paintings of the Milburn and, uh, Melbourne and Milbank uh, uh, Bang families in seven, around 1770, he was showing the householder, right, with his sons and his daughters and the horses and the property and the dogs as a sort of demonstrative projection of what it means to be a gentleman at this time and place. So did Jews have Moorish servants in, oh, sorry, did Jews have Moorish servants in 14th century Catalonia? Yes. But why display her on that side of the table where you can see her fully, where she stands out? I don't believe it is as Geraldine Brooks sort of romanced it because she has a role in the story and she's the one who creates the manuscript. That's very nice. It might be. It might not be. But minimally, it's to project an image of oneself. Here's a very famous painting. It's in the Tel Aviv Museum. You No doubt many of you have seen it. It's Maritzi Gottlieb's Yom Kippur, painted in 1878. And this is a painting that causes many people to cue violins. Right, or, right, you know, you hear it echoing as you see the painting. It's a monumental painting. People have it on music boxes, you know. Grandmothers have prints of it in their homes, right? There's something strange 
about this painting. There are a number of strange things. I'll just go through them a little bit with my students. I ask them to, to sort of tease them out. First of all, the women in the women's section are backed, not fronted by a curtain. And the whole synagogue is compressed. So you see the women quite prominently here. Nobody is connected to anybody else. Everybody's looking in a different direction. This gentleman here has his eyes closed as if in meditation, but being a person with his eyes closed, he doesn't see what's going on around him. And this gentleman, everybody's wearing a kittel, but he is wearing a coat of many colors. And that is because, according to Ezra Mendelssohn, and I trust Ezra Mendelssohn's scholarship on this, I didn't make it up, that's because this is the artist, Maritza Gottlieb himself. He was in love with this woman, but her sister told their, well, squat toad of a mother, um, she told her that he was pasnished. He was unacceptable because he was an artist. And so Maritza Gottlieb painted this painting of himself as Yosef, as Joseph betrayed by his brothers, proceeded to paint his name on the Torah scroll here in memory of the departed soul of Maritza Gottlieb, when out in the rain, caught a cold, and died a month later. Rather than a celebration of the glorious nostalgia of East European Hasidic life, this is an indictment of that society and the lack of the possibility for, of a place of an artist in that society. So things, as Gilbert and Sullivan say, are seldom what they seem. Anytime you look at a work of art, you have to understand that behind that work of art are particular agenda. Yeshiva University has a magnificent Megillus Esther, which, uh, which Ludi Jesselson brought for the uh, museum uh, quite a few years ago when I was at Sotheby's. This happened under my tenure. And um, I remember when it was purchased, there was a celebration of the fact that it demonstrates the loyalty and connection of Jews with their home country or home empire, because here we see at the very beginning of the Megillah a portrait allegedly of Maria Teresa and a portrait allegedly of Emperor Franz Josef. I can't really speak to whether these are portraits of those exact people, but they certainly represent Western Christian Imperium. But what wasn't quite so loudly articulated was another fact. Jews in Central and East Europe often lit their Hanukkiot, their Hanukkah menorahs, and though they lit their Hanukkah menorahs in, 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 in vessels in the shape of patriotic symbols, like the double-headed eagle of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. This was because they were loyal citizens of empire. On the other hand, they felt repressed and oppressed, and indeed they often were repressed and oppressed by those very same regimes. So think for yourself of the irony of standing in front of a Hanukkah menorah that has the shape, let's say, of the American flag, or like May Shaffer Rockland's Hanukkah with the, you know, the, statues of Liber the Statue of Liberty, right, holding up the, uh, the, 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 the Neros, right? Or, in fact, more apropos, this celebration of the Austro-Hungarian Imperium and singing at that time we will prepare the slaughter of the, sla of the blaspheming, the barking, dog-like foe. And then we shall complete with a song, a hymn, the dedication of the altar. There's tremendous anger that requires safety valves among Jews at the same time as they regard themselves as complete and model subjects or citizens of the empires or countries in which they live. The myth that Jews were the model minority never angry, right, is a problematic myth because it idealizes Jews and it indicts others for not being quite as model. So imagine this image when you once again look at, I was going to say our, that is why use Megillah and realize that if this is Franz Josef, he's depicted 
right across from the words, right? Achashverosh, either a stupid king or an evil king. The Talmud is unsure, right? And uh, Maria Theresa, by the first appearance of Vashti, right? Does this mean that the Jews were giving a tremendous screw you to the Austro-Hungarian Empire? Yes, in a certain way. But does it mean also that they didn't consider themselves fully, they weren't fully enfranchised, but fully members of that society? Of course, their style, the fact that they commissioned a Megillah with these images, that, that all the other images in the Megillah are so much of the period and of the place indicates that they were both comfortable and uncomfortable. So I'd like to return to the Falk family. You know, Rebbe Menachem Mendel of Kotsk, Menachem Mendel Morgenstern, important 19th century Hasidic leader, was a very harsh guy. Every Rebbe had his shita, his way. And the way of Menachem Mendel was truth, was emes. When his disciples asked him why he didn't say the word berachamav in mercy, in the phrase in the Birkas Hamazon, rebuild in your mercy Jerusalem, he said, Rachamim, it's time for 2,000 years and we've been exiled. We should ask God for Rachamim. Bonne Yerushalayim. Forget about Rachamim. Rebuild Jerusalem. Or when his students, somewhat naively, davening the, the Kedusha of Musaf, it says, Ayem Mekom Kivodo. Where is the place of God's glory? So they asked him, Rebbe, where, is the, where does God live? He said to them, God. God lives wherever you let God in. Right now, when Heschel translates, it's, it's something like, God dwells wherever man allows him in. But knowing Menachem Mendel, he was a harsh, serious guy. And once his students asked him, he asked his students, I should say, he gave them a faher, he gave them a quiz. He said, no, what's the hardest holiday to observe? And they said, Rebbe, that's easy, it's Sukkot. It's the holiday of tabernacles because we're out in these booths, out in, outside, Right In the wind, in the rain, the pine needles are falling in the soup. It's Poland. It's 30 degrees below zero in the fall. Terrible. He said, no, it's Pesach. Pesach, Rebbe, Pesach. We dress in our best clothes. We display our vessels. It says in the Mishnah Bureau of silver and gold, our best accoutrement of the Seder. There's that word again, accoutrement, right? The nicest things we own. Yes, said Menachem Mendel. But while we do that, we say, avodim hayinu, we were slaves. You're all slaves. Slaves to something, to the Austro-Hungarian Imperium, to the Russian Tsar, to your cell phone, to your email, to your job. You're all slaves. And the worst thing a Jew can do is sit at the Seder table and lie to herself or lie to himself. And that's why Pesach is the hardest holiday. What I see in this image are Jews who are doing very well, but they're doing very well because they work for the man day in and day out. And their doing very well could very easily be transformed into doing not so well if the king for whom they were physician became ill, if they failed to reach their quota of gathering money for the imperial army, and they would be gone in a moment. They would be like the dog who searches for scraps under the table. They will never be free like the free birds outside. They would like to be free like the ravens feeding Elijah. But instead, they're in their little cage. It's a gilded cage, but it's a cage nonetheless. Thank you. Thank you, Mark, for that, um, for helping us appreciate the depth and richness and multifacetedness of images within the Haggadah. Smadar Rosenzweig is Clinical Assistant Professor of Bible and Judaic Studies at Stern College for Women of Yeshiva University. 
where she often blends um, art and visual culture together with um, Judaic studies in her teaching. She was a professor of Judaic studies and history at Lander College for Women at Turo College and a master educator at the Allegra Franco Sephardic Women's Teachers College. She lectures uh, throughout the world now on biblical topics and personalities, although um, perhaps one of her proudest and um, moments is we'd like to congratulate her for becoming a, a grandmother again just a couple of days ago, so mazel tov. Um, and um, she's going to speak to us this evening on images of women in the Haggadah. Smadar. Okay, it's really wonderful to be here tonight. I want to thank Dr. Jacob Weiss for all his hard work in putting this presentation together, and to Dr. Mark Epstein for helping me access important images and introducing me to his important Haggadah work on women in illuminated manuscripts. When I was a child, my parents had an eclectic facsimile collection of early and modern Haggadot, and I was always fascinated with the artwork and the imagery. It felt weird, surreal, to have images, pictures, in religious texts. Subsequently, when I was a Columbia student, Professor Yosef Chaim Yerushalmi, I read his book, Haggadah and History, and was further struck by the proliferation of imagery, and especially female imagery, in the early printed Haggadot. What I'd like to do tonight is really to discuss uh, the role of and the imagery of women in the early printed uh, Haggadot. Uh, we are really the people of the book, and words are our hallmark. For millennia, we transmitted our heritage through texts. We created images mainly through words, letters, ideas, and not images and pictures. The Jewish narrative and legacy was preserved in the words of the Bible, in the Midrashim, right, in rabbinic literature, in the Sidur, just to name a few examples. And one of the most popular text, as we said, to be accompanied in manuscript and print form by pictures is the Haggadah, the Passover Haggadah. So the Haggadah really is an experiential and a narrative text. We tell the story, we live the story, and through the retelling of seminal events in Jewish history and praising God for his miracles, we tell the greatest freedom story in the world, around the table, at home, surrounded by family, and we have a night-long conversation about the exodus from Egypt. We dress a certain way, we recline, we eat foods that symbolize both freedom, freedom and oppress, oppression. And the centerpiece of this night-long conversation is the Haggadah. But what's fascinating about the Haggadah is that the Haggadah really focuses on God and his activities and the deliverance of Egypt that is really performed by God. But really, women, men, humans, are really absent from the Haggadah. They are not the players. They are not the actors in the Haggadah. We have quotes of rabbis. We have quotes of psukim. But all of them are really focused on God's activities, on the actions, right, that took place around Egypt. But we don't have really much information about Moshe, Aharon, and Miriam in the Haggadah. Really, we only want to focus on God. And the question is, right, do we want to put people man, woman, back into the Haggadah as actors in the drama of the exodus from Egypt. Which means, is that what Sipur Yitziat Mitzrayim is supposed to do? Which means the Haggadah is about God and his actions. Are we then supposed to tell the story infusing the Haggadah with the stories of the main actors of that time, of Moshe, of Aharon, of Miriam? So the question is, what do the earliest printed Haggadot do? Mark spoke so beautifully about manuscripts, and those are each one done by hand. But what about the earliest printed Haggadot, where we only have black and white because everything is a print, right? They are mass produced for that time period, right? The Haggadah that I picked, which is the Venice Haggadah, this was a Haggadah that was printed in 1629. And it was translated into three languages. It was translated into Judeo-Italian, Judeo-German, and uh, Judeo-Spanish-Ladino. And the question is, what is the message of the picture 
uh, pictures of the Haggadot. Who is being written back into the story? And what I'd like to propose for tonight is that in addition to humans, right, and the human endeavor, right, and the actors, the players, right, the biblical images and the midrashic images, the people, right, who are so expounded in the Haggadah, right, sorry, in the Midrash and in the Bible, right, that they are being written back into the Haggadah through the images, which means the Haggadah focuses on God, and what we find in the pictures and the etchings is that human actions and people are really written back into the story or drawn back uh, into the story. So the Haggadah that I picked, right, is the 1629 um, Venice Haggadah, it really was already printed um, earlier, but I picked this Haggadah because this Haggadah also has, yeah, also has um, commentary, and the commentary is by Leone Modena, who was a rabbi in Italy, and it's so interesting what he says when they asked him and they commissioned him to write this commentary, because when he wrote the commentary, they already had the images. And what he says is, for it already contains illustrations to entice the bodily eye, how much better there should be an explanation to delight the spiritual eye. So when Rabbi Leone Modena is writing his commentary, right, and they're putting out this Haggadah, it already has the earlier um, pictures, the earlier illustrations, and for many years, this became almost like the Ur text, the main text that the pictures and the um, commentary and the style were really copied in many later uh, Haggadot. Um, Leone Modena calls his commentary Tzli Esh, which is like a finely roasted um, sheep, right? Well, you know, a, a roasted you know, um, piece of meat because he is really writing a shorter interpretation of uh, a Barbanel's commentary called Zevach Pesach, the Paschal or, uh, offering or the Paschal lamb, Zevach Pesach, which means he's saying, okay, I'm going to bridge it. I'm just going to give you all the crispy parts and the best parts, and he's going to really limit, right, the, uh, and summarize what a Barbanel wrote. But what we find in this Haggadah, uh, which I think is very uh, fascinating, is that in the early printed texts, people are really drawn back into the story, which means the Haggadah really focuses on God and his actions. And through, this, um, through these Haggadot and the visual, visual imagery, we get the people back into the story. And what we see when we get the people back into the story uh, is that women, the stories from the Bible and the stories from the Midrash, that women are really drawn back into the story. So as Leon and Modena said that, oh, the visual imagery is like the first commentary and he's giving like a secondary commentary. So what I'd like to say is that these pictures are really writing people back into the text and also is part of Sipur Yitziat Mitzrayim, that maybe we could elaborate on the people and their involvement, right, in the exodus from Egypt. So what I'd like to show is that, um, this uh, Haggadah that we're using tonight is the one that was in um, Judeo-Italian, right? But this Haggadah had an exact copy, right, that was in German, Yiddish, Judeo-German, Yiddish, and also we have a copy in Ladino. So mm -hmm. this was very popular. When you talk about an illuminated manuscript, only one person can have it, right? And it's handed down from generation to generation. But with printing, this really popularized these Haggadot. So this means that these Haggadot were in many people's possessions. It's not just a prized piece that you have as an inside joke, right, with one family. This is something that is really like popular literature. This becomes the printed text. This really becomes more of um, a widespread for whatever time period we're speaking about, right, uh, a text that people have. So, oh, wrong, wrong, right? There we go. So, what we see, I'm getting the hang of it. <laughs> what we see here, number one, in the, um, in the title page, is that the cleaning and all the preparations for Pesach are really all women. So, from the earliest printed book that we have, Right, all the preparations for Pesach, right, are all hard work done by women, 
And not only do women do all the preparations for Pesach, the men are involved in making sure the wheat is shmura matzah and that the water is mayim shalanu, that the water is really made sure and the wheat is um, really watched well. But all the preparations and also the baking of the matzah is done by the women, right? The men are putting it into the oven, but the women are really doing all the preparations. So on the title page, all the preparations for Pesach, the important preparations, um, are done by uh, the women. And what we see here, right, with the language, right, ve'et amalenu elu habanim, we're going to see that the pictures, right, and the et etchings, right, on all these pages are going to be a commentary for the words that we have on the page. In order for you to see the pictures better in the other um, slides, so I only use the picture. So I wanted you to see how a page looks. So you have the commentary, you have the... <laughs> you have the commentary, right, on both sides. Of course, you have the text, and you have the pictures on the bottom. We're going to see this uh, in a larger form. So for the first picture, what I brought is very interesting, is that you have the man and the woman, right, sleeping in separate beds. What this, midra, what this picture is doing, it's really trying to uh, give a visual image for us of the very famous midrash that Amram, once he saw that all the boys were being thrown into the yaor, he said that, you know, everyone has to separate. So what you see very interestingly is that the door of the house is broken because it's a broken home. And you see that the bricks on top are also uh, broken into, right? It's not a complete home. What you also see is that this stool is really fallen over, which means the house is not really complete. It's not together. On the two sides, right, we have David and Shlomo. Most of the pages have Moshe and Aaron. And if you look carefully here, it explains why right, was a decision made, and everyone knows that this is a play on the Midrash of Amram telling everybody to separate from their wives, because all the young, right, male infants, right, are going to be thrown into the Yor. And you see the Egyptian throwing the baby in, and the Jewish mother, right, wailing, right, that her children are taken away from her. This is a a better example, right, and again, there's so many pages that have these images, and this is almost like a triptych, where you have the uh, one image here, you have the main image in the middle, and then you have um, uh, a third image over here, and here, again, it's talking about what is the fate of the young men, right, of the babies, and I just want to uh, say that just the other day, um, I became... Uh, a grandmother again, and my husband, Rev Rosenzweig, is here as well. And it's interesting, even though we don't talk about numbers in, uh, you know, when we talk about children, but this is my sixth grandchild, right? And I have five daughters, and this was my first grandson. So I thought with this whole imagery, it's so interesting, because part of the medrash is that the women were having six children at once. And again, so the images are going to be a mix of the medrash and also of the biblical text. Here... Sorry. Here, what you see in all of these images is every time they will show babies, they're always going to show six at once, to show that the women all had six babies at once. I'm not showing the um, slide tonight, but there are beautiful images of the women having six children all around them, nursing their children, and also of the famous Midrash that the women went to the water, right, and then they collected water and fish, and then they had relations with their husbands under the apple tree, and you have a beautiful image in this Haggadah of the husband and wife sitting under the apple tree, and she's looking into her mirror, the Marot Sovot, and in the background you have all the young babies that were born as a result of the enterprise uh, of the women. So what this, midra what this um, slide is really showing, what this page shows, is the um, meeting between Paro and Shifra Umpua, the nursemaids, right, when he wants to tell them that they should throw all the boys into the Yaor, right? They don't participate, and that's why he has to ask his countrymen to take all the young boys, all the babies, and throw them 
into the or. So here you have the locals, right, throwing all the Jewish babies into the or. But here we also have an interesting image. We have a young girl. Is that Miriam looking from afar to see what's going to happen? Because these are three different images. You have to think of it like a triptych, before, middle, and after. And here you have Miriam, the young daughter, and Yocheved speaking to the daughter of Paro, where she took the baby out, and then you have Miriam and Yocheved, right? Miriam was the one who spied, right? The daughter of Paro, and she asks Yocheved to be the nursemaid. So what you find in the Haggadah is that all the details of the actions of the people, right, and especially of the women, whether it's in the biblical text or it's in the Midrash, are all drawn back into the Haggadah. So in a sense, the Haggadah, the pictures of the Haggadah, are a commentary, are part of Sipri Yitziat Mitzrayim, of drawing and writing the women back into the text. Here you have, here you have um, Moshe and Aaron, right? Not as participants, which they are in many pictures, but in order to keep them on a regular basis in the story and in the flow, we have them on both sides of the commentary. But what's fascinating about this, about this picture also is that the men are all singing Shiratayam, and this is Moshe leading them, right? And then in the distance, we have Miriam leading the women in song, and she is uh, playing the tambourine. And in the end, this is the last picture that I want to, to bring, is that at the Passover Seder, in every single Haggadah, except in very few, we always have the women sitting uh, at the Seder. And um, even though Mark might disagree, right, I think that the fact that we have the women baking the matzahs and we have the women preparing uh, for Pesach and we have uh, the stories of the biblical uh, images and the Midrashic images, and almost every single Haggadah has women sitting at the table. Now, what we see also here is the idea of how uh, women were really involved in every single part of the Pesach process, whether it is in contemporary times, which means when they're actually celebrating Pesach, right, or preparing, as we saw on the first panel, or, right, in the imagery from the earlier time periods, whether it's biblical or midrashic. So what I'd like to propose is that the visual imagery, the imagery, right, and the pictures in the Haggadah, especially in the printed uh, Haggadot, but also we see it in so many beautiful illuminated manuscripts, that um, humans, right, the human endeavor is put it back into the Haggadah, but especially we also see um, all the details uh, of the involvement of women, right, in the story of the Exodus, and also at the contemporary time period, which means at the Seder, preparing for the Seder, right, baking the matzahs just like they baked the matzahs in, um, wait, ah, there it is, just like they baked the matzahs in Mitzrayim, right, they bake and prepare the matzahs, right, in contemporary times. Just like the women were involved in the early miracles, right, they're also involved in celebrating. So through the visual and the pictures, right, you really see how the women um, are drawn back in, especially in these kind of uh, popular Haggadot. Thank you. Thank you so much, Smadar, for um, really enriching us on um, not just the tension and power, but the very life of images and um, I think as, a, as an art historian, it resonates with me just to what degree images like these tell things that are not actually in the text right next to it and how, how, how much there is this lively exchange. Yeah. Um, Ronnie Perilous is professor of Sephardic studies at the Bernard Revel Graduate School of Jewish Studies at Yeshiva University. His research, research explores connections between Iberian and Jewish culture during the medieval and early periods. Among uh, one of the things he focuses on, which he'll be discussing this evening, um, the dynamics of religious transformation within the context of the crypto-Jewish experience. 
His forthcoming book, Blood and Faith, explores family and identity in the Sephardic Atlantic world. He'll be speaking this evening on exposure, memory, and commemoration, thoughts on capturing Passover in Frederick Brenner's Los Moranos. Ronnie. It's a great honor to be here. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you for all the hard work of Jacob and Stu, really uh, putting it all together. So many pieces, so many dynamic speakers um, from so many different angles. And what's really amazing, I, I find, as we've discussed before, before coming up here, getting together, is how on so many ways each talk is so distinct, both historically and, and methodologically, and yet there's, there's a conversation that I think you'll, we're starting to see develop that I'm excited to see when we sit down here and, and you guys can all be part of that. Um, so tonight's talk, um, really, I, I think the, the first moment, the first uh, germination of this talk happened when I was a college student and I was home in my hometown of Miami Beach and there was a Jewish film festival. And as a college student in between uh, semesters with nothing else to do, I just went to the festival. And one afternoon, they showed Frederick Brenner's The Last Moranos. Frederick Brenner is a, a very you know, world-acclaimed um, photographer. And he, wrote, he, he filmed, made this film about this group of crypto-Jews or former crypto-Jews in the northern part of, of, of Portugal in the town of Belmonte. Um, which is a tiny little town um, close to the Spanish border where there was a sizable group of, of, of conversos, who, many of whom um, still into the early 20th century and beyond maintained and practiced forms of Judaism secretly. Um, and the movie was a re revelation to me. It was very powerful. It's beautifully shot, very human. Um, the subject of Moranos, crypto Jews, conversos, elicits a tremendous amount of passion, um, argument, mystery, romance, um, and a lot of a lot of uh, misunderstanding. And and it's for that reason that it's so exciting to work in this field, um, and it's really so exciting to come to a public forum to discuss it because people come with so many ideas of their own. And it's very exciting to be able to share that. And, and tonight, I want to peel away a little bit of that mystery and, and some of the ways that that romance can blind us, um, but also think about this subject with empathy and with humanity and with an appreciation for the aesthetic as well, uh, which I think is all going on here. Um, the way we see things, Mark started out with us thinking about the frames that we don't even realize that are often framing what we look at and what we see. Um, and, and the way we, as viewers, change what's there. Um, so let's start with a little bit of history. Um, so, so this, so this uh, comes from Amsterdam. This is an early machzor um, from the Amsterdam community. It's from 1612, rather early in their history. The Amsterdam community was founded entirely by people who lived as Catholics for several generations. People who were forcibly converted in Portugal in, in 1497 and who over a period of time starting in the late 16th century found their way to the tolerance of Amsterdam and founded this amazing community which we have the most recent representative of the New York branch of, of the community here uh, in our midst. Um, the symbol, one of the symbols of the community is the phoenix rising from the fire. It's not for nothing. This is a community that was, for, like I said, for several generations, not just one, several generations lived as Catholics and made it out of that experience to found a, a, a thriving strong community which was an irva emba Israel to many, many, many and founding its own diaspora into the Western, throughout the Western world. When they come out of Portugal, they no longer have to be in secret. They can be open and soon enough, 1630, they will already, 1630s they already have their own beautiful synagogue 
small. By 1676, they will have one of the most monumental synagogues in all of Western Europe, um, right in the middle of town, beautifully open, and, and, and a, actually a tourist attraction, uh, which caused the rabbis uh, much consternation because it meant that they had to shut up their congregants and stop them from fist fighting and spitting on the floor. Um, and great taka note. Anyways, this, um, so these Jews were able to bring in scholars, bring in chachamim from all over the Jewish world to teach them to bring in, to bring in books, to bring in typeset. They, they were in Amsterdam, a major center of printing, and soon enough were printing and translating into Spanish and Portuguese everything a Jew would need, okay? And this is a great example of it. But what do you do if you're still in Portugal? What do you do if you're still in Lisbon or in Belmonte or in Braganza and if you, you, if you own a Jewish book, that's enough to be arrested by the very ruthless Portuguese Inquisition. Um, and how do you maintain your Judaism? So there are multiple theories about how Conversos in that situation maintained their Judaism. There's a lot of controversy over how many of them cared to maintain their Judaism. This is a huge topic for many, many other talks. But one of the main theories is, well, they had oral knowledge of traditional Jewish sources from before the forced, before the forced conversion. And they maintained it orally, being passed down from father to son, from mother to daughter. And in that way they maintained a robust, uh, uh, um, a robust, at first, tradition of, of practice, and slowly, over time, that would get diluted, just like a game of telephone, right? Um, and that was the, that's a very classic theory. The other, th what we've, the other theory is they just made stuff up. They were very creative. They took whatever knowledge they could. They accessed Jewish sources in a Catholic context, taking a Catholic Bible, which has, by the way, not only the Old Testament, but also the Apocrypha, that has a lot of uh, inter uh, Second Temple literature that has a tremendous mystical and spiritual value, and taking those sources, reworking them in your own way, and creating your own tefillot, your own poems of, 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 of thanksgiving or of penitence, and we have examples of that as well. And a third way that's, that's been understood, and, and none of these are exclusive, obviously. These are all, you, all these things can be happening at the same time. The last one is a realization, really over the last, really, thanks to, um, to a great measure uh, to, to the work of, of Joseph Kaplan, that showed how in, integrated these communities in Portugal and in Spain were, and also in the Americas, were with open Jewish communities in places like Italy, places like Morocco, places like, like the Ottoman Empire, and obviously Amsterdam. So a, 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 a Portuguese Jew, formerly a Portuguese converso, living in Amsterdam, would have cause to go back to Portugal for business. And guess what? Along the way, they can either teach orally Jewish sources to some of their converso cousins, or they can actually bring books with them. They could bring books in Spanish and Portuguese and leave them, leave them behind, and then people can make copies, and so on and so forth. So... We have evidence of this. There are inquisitorial records of this, of people being found with books printed in Amsterdam or books printed in Livorno or handwritten works which are clearly from an open Jewish community. But we also have ways that those open sources get reworked. And, and this, this is a fascinating realm uh, of Jewish creativity under extremely difficult circumstances, um, which... In the early 20th century, we gained a new window on, into this. Most of the examples we have are from people in the 16th century, 17th century. The Inquisition was, was disbanded around, the 18, around 1825. Um, Jews were not officially allowed into Portugal till much later, but Moroccan Jews start settling in Portugal in, in the early, in the, about the midpoint of the 19th century. In 1910, we have a major break. 1910, there's a, there's a revolution, the, the king is deposed, and we have a Republican government, which was very anti-clerical, which gave an opening for all sorts of interesting religious experiences and, and, and experiments away from Catholicism. And this created an opening for some groups of conversos, people who knew that they were different than everyone else, people who, despite the fact that they went to church every Sunday and, and ate everything that everyone else ate, 
Um, everyone knew that they were converso, and, and they knew, or, or, or knew Christian, and, and they knew it as well. So there was an ethnic identity which existed, and these people in 1910 start coming out and start being more open about their Judaism, some of them in very prominent ways, some of them in much more humble, quiet ways. When, this, when the Republic falls in the late 20s, and the Salazar regime is firmly entrenched in the early 30s, this opening shuts up again because the church is now empowered again and many of these communities and individuals are rightfully scared and they go underground again. And it's only with the fall in the 70s, the early 70s of the Salazar regime and the opening up of Portugal that these people start coming out again in larger numbers. I'm simplifying the story and there are many excellent works of history on this and I'm just trying to give a, give a sense of where we're at for the pictures we're going to look at. So let's take a look, first of all. We'll go back to that if we have a second. This individual of Converso origin was a decorated hero in the World War I. Portugal was on the side of the Allies. Um, he fought in, in Belgium and was a decorated hero. Um, and he, after the war, came back, was decorated, as I said, and wanted to explore his Judaism deeply. He was living in Lisbon and reached out to the, to the Moroccan community there, which was not very friendly to him. And um, he moved to Tangier and spent time in Morocco learning and studying and going through a, a, a full conversion. He married this woman, Leah, who was a Jew, um, love of his life, and he went back to Portugal in the 20s and in in Porto, up in the north, um, founded his own Jewish community. There, he, he managed to get people to send money to build this beautiful synagogue. And he starts his own Beit Midrash, where he's teaching other conversos, or children of conversos, people who want to come back to Judaism. Um, and it, he's a very, very important figure in this all the way through. Um, this is a journal you see here. He's referred to as the Apostle of the Moranos, a term that was obviously pejorative, but then turned into a positive mark. Uh, this book by, by, by Samuel Schwartz, um, also extremely important in the opening up of this community. Samuel Schwartz was a, a, a mine engineer, a Polish Jew, from a religious Moscilic background, comes to Portugal working on this mi in mining in the area around Belmonte, and guess what? People start telling him about Jews and he starts getting interested. This is all around the same time that these Jews are starting to be more open. He studies them. He writes down their prayers. He, he writes this book, The New Christians of Portugal in the 20th Century. Foundational book, obviously with a lot of problems, but that's, that's okay. The 70s. This is the, this, so, at, so in the 70s, like I said, the Jews in, in Belmonte that were closeted again because of the dictatorship, start coming out more and more. But before they get big, you know, before they get major world attention, um, Frederick Brenner comes in, and he gets there in the, in, the, in the mid-80s and spends a lot of time with them, takes a lot of pictures, and, and, um, and, and makes, a, makes this beautiful documentary that we're going to take, take a look at. Um, we're going to go back to this image, but can we, can we cue the first section? Thank you. Um, what we're going to see now is them preparing. Well, I'll just let you see. You'll, you'll see it. All right. Santa Festa, Easter, is the most important rite for the Jews of Belmont. It is also the rite for which they have suffered the most. During the time of the Inquisition, it was the most dangerous to observe because it lasted an entire week.
So we see many of these elements combining here. But the first thing I want to say is, you notice at the beginning she's saying shh, shh, shh. And, the, and I decided to cut the scene here. They go, a little, they, they spend a little more time preparing. Um, but it stops because she hears a knock. And she says stop, right? Yet they're living in a time when there's no inquisition. They're, the, they're living in a democratic republic. Um, yeah, there's some, there's some kind of, you know, there's some anti... Jewish sentiment maybe in the street and some prejudice here and there, but we're not dealing with someone who's going to arrest them and throw them into a dungeon um, and torture them, as they mentioned in the song. Um, this is part of, I, I start, I, I call the, the talk exposure, commemoration, and memory because all those things are happening. Uh, there's a commemoration of what they used to do um, that's being frozen by this, by this or captured by this film. Um, it's captured in an even a more striking way by the still, and the still life of them, which on one level, oh, can we get that up? Thank you so much. Uh, where you, you know, there's a certain um, honesty to it, there's a certain um, heroism to, to, their, to their stance um, and dignity. Um, at the same time, it's very posed, right? I mean, it's a very posed picture. There's not people just doing their thing. Um, but without it, we could never see the past. But that exposure, those of, those of us here who remember film cameras know that when you, you know, if you open up the, the, the you know, when, if you didn't roll back the film properly and you opened it up, you lost your film. And that's part of what happens, right? You open up um, these communities and and they will no longer be there, and there aren't, and that's probably a good thing, and that's, probably, that's what they want to do. They do want to leave, but when we're looking, um, it, it's always, you know, the ethics of that is always very problematic. Um, but to get to, to some of the issues of the prayer, if you noticed, there's multiple midrashic references. For instance, when you struck the sea, it went into 12 paths, not something you'd find in the, in, in the Bible, clearly something that they're either bringing in oral tradition or for somewhere else. Um, and, and then there are all sorts of personal details, think, references to being imprisoned, for instance, and things like that. Also, the focus on penitence is very, very, very powerful. It's in Pesach, and, and, and the ideas about Pesach, but it's also um, a very powerful element in crypto-Jewish religion, whereby they constantly carry a tremendous degree of guilt over not being fully Jewish. And, and so the idea of penitence, wearing all white, they start by, by, by spreading water throughout the, the house to kind of purify it. So all these things are a uh, part of, of this, uh, of the ritual. And so they're, again, bringing their own experiences into it, using previous sources and combining. Um, we're going to look at one last, one last um, uh, clip, which shows a fascinating um, minhag that they had, which was to go to the a small little river near, near their town called the Zesere on the last day of Pesach and to do a little ritual that we're going to see. Um, so let's take a look. Foi uma jaz que abriu as águas para passar o nosso povo. E nós cortamos as águas, é como fazia Santo Moisés, por causa dele abrir a água para o nosso povo. Yeah, the mile is a mile, and 
So this may be their own practice that they developed over time. Other crypto-Jewish groups in that region do not do that. They don't go to the river. What's fascinating is that in Morocco, during the Maimouna festival, a very important, which, is, which is celebrated the night after Pesach, the last day of Pesach, after Shvi Shal Pesach or Achron Shal Pesach, um, the daytime of Maimouna um, is celebrated by going to wells, riverbanks, or the ocean and having picnics. And, and so it could very well be that this was something that, that traveled there. It's unclear. Um, but in any case, they make it their own. And, and we can thank Brenner for, for capturing that practice. This is a picture after that ceremony. You saw them closing their eyes and, 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 and praying. Um, that's one of that's a picture from from his diasporas. Um, so I, I think we were able to shuttle back between the still, the 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 and and the and the moving image, and also the the problematics of of capturing the past. And thank you so much. Thank you, Ronnie, for that. Um very moving reflection on deeply personal and liberational aspects of the holiday. Yeah. Mayor Soloveitchik is director of the Zahava and Moshal Strauss Center for Torah and Western Thought at Yeshiva University and rabbi of Congregation Sheriff Israel in Manhattan, which you heard uh, referred to before. And I've had a distinct uh, honor and um, real joy and pleasure of uh, teaching uh, two classes um, now with um, Zali, uh, one on um, the image and idea, and one uh, on Rembrandt and the Jews, uh, which we'll be teaching again this fall at Yeshiva College. And um, you'll, you'll see he'll more about uh, Rembrandt and Michelangelo and, and other uh, Jewish figures from um, Rabbi Soloveitchik. Thank you so much, Professor Weiss. It's wonderful to be here with you. My profound thanks to you and to Stu for everything that you did to put this together. I feel privileged to be part of such a distinguished panel of speakers. And uh, I want to thank uh, Professor Pirellis for making reference, obviously, to my own Sephardic uh, background. Uh, Spanish, Portuguese, Jews, well-known ancestors of the Soloveitchik family. Um, I've converted to Sephardic Judaism recently, and Pesach has been amazing since then. Um, actually, Stu, Stu actually today sent me a quote he saw on the internet which said, as you gather around your Passover seders next week, please remember there are a group of Jews who will have nothing to eat this Pesach. They're called the Ashkenazim. <laughs> so in the spirit of food, I rise today not only to ponder the art and imagery of the Haggadah, but also to praise the most unappreciated Pesach food, the morsel most seldom celebrated at the Seder, and that is the egg. While no mention is made of the Pesach egg in classical halachic sources, which only state that a cooked food be placed on the table or on the Seder plate, in memory of the Korban Chagiga, the celebratory holiday sacrifice that used to be brought in Temple times, ultimately, universally, the Jewish people chose the egg to serve in this role. And among Ashkenazic Jews, many go out of their way to actually ingest the egg or several eggs during the Seder meal. Thus, the egg became a central Passover food, which explains why every Passover season, every store in America is selling chocolate eggs. 
It's an obvious explanation. I think, Professor Epstein, that's historically correct, right? The scholarship is, my scholarship is solid here. You should learn, watch and learn. But this is actually mysterious, this celebrating the egg, because we know that the egg is first and foremost a symbol for Judaism, not of Chag, but of Avelut, not of celebration, but of mourning. Indeed, one of the most traditional forms of the Suda HaMafseket, the last meal eaten before Tisha B'Av, the fast of the ninth of Av, the saddest day in the Jewish calendar in which we mark all of the tragedies that have occurred to the Jewish people. The meal that is eaten is bread, ashes, and eggs, eaten not at the family table, but each individual alone, sitting silently on a floor. The egg, we are further informed in the Talmud, is the archetypal symbol of mourning because it has no apparent opening. Thus the mourner sits on Erev Tisha B'Av without engaging in conversation, pondering all the terrible events that have occurred to our people in the past, for which no explanation can be offered, indeed for which explanation would be inexcusable. And so we stand mute or sit mute like the unopened egg. And yet, at the Seder, the most celebratory moment on the Jewish calendar, the egg makes a reappearance. And noting the only two times that eggs are an essential aspect of the meal, Tisha B'Av and Pesach, the Ramar of Moshe Israelis, the, the Ashkenazic Posek in Shulchan Aruch in the Code of Jewish Law, only exacerbates the enigma by cryptically commenting that in the Jewish calendar, the first day of Pesach and the ninth of Av always come out on the same day of the week each year. Thus, he writes, the egg at the Seder expresses that the two, Passover and the ninth of Av, are forever linked. And it's with this in mind that we may reflect on an artistic linking between the ninth of Av and Pesach. In the Sistine Chapel, among Michelangelo's depiction of the prophets, we find his Jeremiah. The prophet is seated, devoid of the strength to stand, overwrought by despair. Michelangelo's Jeremiah is in marked contrast with his Isaiah, who stands rather than sits, who is clean-shaven, who looks a, ho- a heck of a lot less Jewish, and devoid of a Jewish beard, beatifically predicting the coming of the Messiah. Taken together, for this Christian artist, the two figures represent, first, the doom and destruction wrought upon Jerusalem and upon Judaism, so that it could be superseded by the Christian church. And yet, as scholars note, Michelangelo's Jeremiah is then copied almost exactly in several Haggadot. So here we have the Mantua Haggadah, 1560. Yirmiyahu, Jeremiah, the prophet of doom, here celebrates the Seder as a wise son. Here he is the Chacham. I'm sorry, this is, here is the Chacham, this is Mantua, and here a little bit later, the Venice Haggadah, he is one of the sages at Rabbi Akiva Seder in Bnei Brak, Rabbi Lazar ben Azaria. And so, here we have uh, a artistic version of the egg, a deliberate joining of the Jeremiah of Tisha B'Av, of the destruction of the temple, and Jeremiah as a guest at the Pesach Seder. Jeremiah, the prophet of destruction, and Jeremiah as a sage celebrating redemption. Here, the artist seizes the symbol of Avelut, of mourning, and renames it, as it were, repurposes it for Chagiga, for Chag, for celebration, utilizing it as a symbol of celebration. Here, the Jeremiah is almost exactly the same, with only one difference. Anyone see what the difference is? They gave him a yarmulke. That's the important difference. Here you see it's just like when they have, you know, like the passport picture of the Lubavitcher Rebbe has him without a yarmulke. And then the Hasidim now Photoshop in a yarmulke. So here you have Photoshopped yarmulke in for Jeremiah. But you have Jeremiah, Michelangelo, utilizing him as the prophet of destruction. And here he is utilized in the Haggadah as a very different image. So we have the joining together. Like with the egg, two days, two images, two ideas that could not be more different. Tisha B'Av and Pesach. Jeremiah mourning for the destruction of the temple and Jeremiah celebrating the Seder. One image, one idea is all about death and devastation. The other is about celebration and perpetuation. 
One, as in Echa, as in the book of Lamentations. I think, Jacob, I lost my images here. You take a, you, you keep, take a look, I'll keep going. One, as in Echa in Lamentations, focuses on tragedy. Thank you so much. The other on Vigarata Levincha, on focusing on our posterity, on telling the story of the Exodus to our children. And I believe that this odd calendrical conjunction and culinary conjunction and artistic conjunction can be briefly explained in three ways, biblically, emotionally, and theologically. First, biblically. Placing Jeremiah at the center of the Haggadah reminds us that for Jews, as much as he is the prophet of devastation, he is just as much the prophet of redemption. Rabbi Sachs has noted that Jeremiah, the most passionate and tormented of all the prophets, has gone down in history as the prophet of doom, yet this is unfair. He was also supremely a prophet of hope. Jeremiah's feelings of doom and hope were not in conflict. They were two sides of the same coin. The God who sentences people to exile would be the God who brought them back. For though his people might forsake him, he, God, would never forsake them, end quote. Meaning that the prophet who has given us the most infamous predictions of doom, Jeremiah, has also bequeathed us with some of the most eloquent expressions of Jewish hope. God in Sefer Yirmiyahu is not only the vengeful king who destroys Jerusalem, he is also, as we read on Rosh Hashanah, the parent who assures Rachel, Yesh Tikvala Acharitech, there is hope in the future of Eshavu Banim Likvulam, your children will return to their land. The very prophet that saw Jerusalem destroyed and the Holy Land ravaged is the very same prophet who guarantees us that Od Yiknu Batimu Kramim, land will still one day be bought again. Real estate will be acquired again by Jews in the land of Israel. And so, if the Sistine's Jeremiah marks the destruction of Jerusalem and of Judaism, it overlooks the fact that Jeremiah speaks explicitly about the eternity of the Jewish people. And you can't have one without the other. The theologian Michael Wishagrad of blessed memory describes how he once met in Switzerland Karl Barth, the most significant Protestant theologian of the 20th century. And Barth said to him, quote, he said, you Jews have the promise but not the fulfillment. We Christians have both promise and fulfillment. Wishagrad, influenced by the banking atmosphere of Basel, replied heatedly to him. He said, with human promise, one can have the promise and not the fulfillment. But a promise of God is like money in the bank. If we have his promise, we have his fulfillment. And if we do not have his fulfillment, then we do not have the promise. There was a period of silence. And then Bart says, you know, I never thought of it that way. Placing Michelangelo's image in a Haggadah utilized in Christendom makes the somewhat subversive point that Jeremiah's prophecy of the destruction of Jerusalem is inextricably bound up with his guarantee of the return to Jerusalem and the rebuilding of Jerusalem. Thus, the linking of Tisha B'Av and Pesach is the ultimate affirmation biblically of Jewish hope. That's biblically, now emotionally. There's another point to be made here, and, and that is that in a profound way, our experience of the ninth of Av and Pesach enhance each other. Only the Jews relive their tragedies with such extraordinary agony, but the Jews also love life and celebrate life in their homes, perhaps more than any other people on earth. And the reason for these two are joined, because one experience lends profundity to the other. This Passover, we mark the first yard site of Ambassador Yehuda Avner, author of the magisterial memoir, The Prime Ministers, and perhaps the most memorable story I ever heard from him uh, in a remarkable speech was a story that was not something that he experienced in the inner sanctum of the Prime Ministers of Israel that he served. Ha could have been any of us who witnessed this, just happened to happen to him. He said that he was once outside in Jerusalem. He saw a young man, an Israeli soldier, on his way to army duty. And this young man was saying goodbye to his grandfather. The grandfather wished to show his grandson what this army service meant to him. And so the grandfather rolled up his sleeve and showed his chayal grandson the numbers tattooed on his arm. In response, the grandchild said nothing, but he reached into his own shirt, took out his metal army tags from the Israeli army, and showed his grandfather his own numbers. A simple moment but one so instructive in describing how the past lends profundity to our present and, how, and how, it can, how focusing on the tragedies that have occurred 
lends obligation to our marking of redemption. Joining Tisha B'Av and Pesach together, ensuring that Jeremiah is present at our Seder, whether in an egg or an art, is in a certain sense expressing an idea similar to that in the Gettysburg Address. It is for us, the living, rather, to be de dedicated here to the unfinished work, which they who fought here have thus so far nobly advanced. It is rather for us here to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion, that we highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain. In a similar sense, our experience of those who are no longer here, our appreciation of Tisha B'Av is what obligates us ultimately in the central purpose of the Seder of Sipur Yetziat Mitzrayim, of telling over the story of the Exodus, v'higadata levincha, of covenantal transmission, of teaching it to our children, the ultimate guarantee of the eternity of our people. Finally, theologically, linking Jeremiah to the Seder celebration, Tisha B'Av to Pesach expresses the audacious idea that pondering the tragedies of our history as Michelangelo, as Jeremiah does in Michelangelo's painting, can lead us to ponder and to appreciate all that Pesach proclaims. And first and foremost, Asher Bachar Banu Mikol Am, the chosenness of the Jewish people. Talmud famously describes how Rabbi Akiva and his colleagues were strolling along the ruins of Jerusalem and they saw a fox exploring the desolate Temple Mount. As his compatriots cried, seeing this as bitter evidence of the destruction that an animal snuffled and dug where the ark had once proudly stood. Rabbi Akiva, however, laughed, explaining cryptically to his astonished friends that now the eventual redemption and triumph of Israel was assured. It was Rabbi Joseph Soloveitchik around 50 years ago who illuminated Rabbi Akiva's reaction in a manner that it has always meant a great deal to me. I'm going to say it in Yiddish, I assume. Everybody here speaks fluent Yiddish. Um, I speak uh, Lithuanian Yiddish, just the, the Yiddish that Moshe Rabbeinu spoke, just to uh, make it clear. I happen to be actually not by descent a Sephardi, but rather a Litvak. Some of you speak a Litzianer Yiddish. <clears throat> Does that mean I'm better than you? Probably, yeah. Um, but Rav Soloveitchik explained it as follows. Rabbi Kiva was thinking, why did this fox choose of all possible places the Temple Mount, the Holy of Holies, in which to meander? He has no better places, no better archaeological sites in which to go spelunking. Rather, Rabbi Akiva concluded that the fox was drawn to that precise site because, in Rav Soloveitchik's words, the shul had geweist instinctive as di mokem is helig. Because even the fox felt viscerally that that site, that the Temple Mount, was sacred. Rav Soloveitchik interpreted this homiletically but powerfully. Rabbi Akiva, he said, saw the event of the fox as symbolic of the Jewish historical experience. For if our enemies are willing to expend such disproportionate effort in order to destroy us, therefore, Rabbi Akiva reasoned, Judaism must embody a very powerful and eternal idea indeed. In the efforts of, efforts of countless nations to wipe out the chosen nation, in their visceral sense that their worldview is threatened by what we embody, therein we actually discover the very vindication of our chosenness. In a similar vein, the writer Yossi Klein Halevi, a friend of mine, once reflected that often living in Jerusalem, he does not feel in any way remarkable. But then he writes, I suddenly remember where I am. I recall my father's wonder at the wall, whose fragile and improbable endurance he saw as a metaphor for the Jewish people. Like him, writes Yossi, I ask myself what it is about this strange little people that continually finds itself at the center of international attention, repeatedly on the front lines against totalitarian forces of evil, Nazism, Soviet communism, now jihadism, all of which have marked the Jews as their primary obstacle to achieving world domination. At these moments, Yossi writes, I feel gratitude for having found my place in this story. The Jeremiah pondering the destruction by tyrants of the Jewish people and of Judea again and again is ultimately, no pun intended, of one picture with the Jewish sages as Jeremiah pondering the redemption both in the past and as guaranteed in the future for pondering the hatred that our enemies has had for us 
ultimately allows us to understand the very special nature of the Jewish people. A couple years after the Sistine, good couple years, Rembrandt gave us a Jeremiah of his own. Here too, I know Rembrandt's the best, right? Yeah, he's the best. Uh, painted in Leiden when Rembrandt was young, Rembrandt puts Jeremiah in a similar pose to that of Michelangelo, sitting in great despair, pondering the destruction that has been wrought. Here is the fire of Jerusalem. He is looking at wealth that has been given to him by Nebuchadnezzar, that's in Josephus, but ultimately he remains in despair. But unlike Michelangelo, Rembrandt has added one other detail, and that is the object on which, Rembrandt, on which Jeremiah is leaning. And that, of course, is a book of scripture. I visited Rembrandt's home in Amsterdam last June. Several weeks later, my wife and I, after standing in Rembrandt's home, where he created most of his works, not this one, this was in Leiden, but most of his works in Amsterdam. If, you've see, if you haven't been there, you absolutely should go. Rembrandt lived there until he went bankrupt. As one person pointed out to me, Rembrandt lived among the Spanish-Portuguese Jews, and his biggest mistake was that while he liked Jews very much and he painted Jews very often, he didn't have a Jewish accountant. And so <laughs> he went bankrupt and uh, had, to move, had to move out of his house. But immediately after visiting Rembrandt's home, I went with my wife to the Israel Museum, where this painting was on loan from the Reichsmuseum and on display in Yerushalayim. And I thought to myself, when Rembrandt was painting this beautiful depiction of Jeremiah mourning for the destruction of Jerusalem, could he ever have imagined that one day this painting would be on display in a rebuilt Jerusalem? Could he ever have predicted it? Probably not. But if his painting of Jeremiah's mourning for Jerusalem can be seen today in a rebuilt capital of Jerusalem, it is in part because of generations of Jews who were very much like Rembrandt's generation, who mourned for the destruction of the temple, but also sought solace and support in the promises of scripture and in God's guarantees, which they believed from Pesach to Pesach was like money in the bank. Jews who read Jeremiah's words on the ninth of Av and felt his despair, but also felt his faith and his presence at their Seder, and therefore embodied his hope at their table. Jews who sat on the floor from generation to generation and mourned for the temple on the saddest night of the year and never forgot Jerusalem, but then sat at the Seder and told their children with faith and with hope and with joy. L'shana haba Yerushalayim. Thank you and Chak HaShar V'Sameach. Um, I think um, since we've had uh, just a remarkably rich uh, array of um, discussion and, and questions, and thank you, I just wanted to thank um, our four speakers again, Mark and Smadar and Ronnie and uh, Mayer for their wonderful talks. Thank you. Um, I think uh, in, in the spirit of uh, perhaps continuing uh, these discussions uh, leading up uh, to uh, Seder's a little over a week from now, we'll, we'll ask you to join us for a um, uh, wine reception in the, um, in the Great Hall outside. Um, and if, uh, if you have any questions for our speakers, we, we ask you to um, please uh, engage them. Uh, a chag kasher v'sameach to everyone. Uh, wonderful holiday, and thank you so much for coming here this evening. <laughs>